Hello, so this video will cover both Unit 5, Part A, Equilibrium, and Unit 5, Part B, Gas Laws. I picked questions that were not similar to the ones that we did in class, and I believe after teaching it numerous times throughout this week to students that I'll give you a better ground frame to answer these questions. All right, so Le Chatier, it's where all this comes from. Uh, essentially, he said there's an effect. You have a system, you have snowballs going left and right, and if somehow you affect this perfect equilibrium of snowballs going left and right, the, the shift is going to make up for the change. So if there is a change, there's going to be a shift. It's going to make up for that change. So we'll do a brief uh, example before we get into questions. Uh, the change in heat on the right, that change in H, that enthalpy is negative. That means that it's an exothermic reaction, meaning it releases heat. Now, if I were to take away nitrogen, the reaction is no longer at equilibrium. The snowballs are no longer going back and forth at the same rate. Therefore, the reaction has to shift in the direction to make up for that loss in nitrogen. Therefore, hydrogen is going to increase, and H3 is going to decrease, and the amount of heat being released is going to decrease. So if this is in a glass, it's going to feel less hot. Now, if we're to do the opposite, which is increase nitrogen, the reaction shifts to the right, hydrogen going to go down and H3 is going to go up and the heat is going to go up. So the glass is going to feel warmer. So you can practice this with Alex module 21. You can go back. If you finished it, you can go back and practice it all you want. I picked new questions that were not like the ones we did in class, but were ones that you did on your own when you finish this module. Now, the first one is very similar to the ones that we did in class. Um, right now, we have a reaction in equilibrium. So just assume those double arrows. We put in the double arrows later. I know I say that all the freaking time. So, uh, so imagine we have this thing. Imagine 230 millimoles of this compound there are added to a flask containing a mixture of all this stuff at equilibrium. So that is at equilibrium. How do you highlight? At equilibrium. Answer the following questions. So a lot of what we do, a lot of what I'm going to say, I'm going to say like, God, ah, don't read this. This is a bunch of, you know, garbage. Don't read this. Uh, this you have to read. What is the rate of the reverse reaction before any C2H5OH? Oh my gosh, before any C2H5CO2CH3 has been added to the flask. No change has taken place. Remember, at equilibrium, the snowball is going from the left. Like in class, uh, you guys played for like five seconds, uh, the snowball is going left and snowball is going to the right. We're at uh, at one point, I was looking straight forward, and I saw, you know, like three go each direction. That was at equilibrium. The forward reaction is always equal to the reverse reaction. So greater than zero. Um, and uh, equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So that's always true. At equilibrium, forward and reverse reaction are always zero, are always equal. What is the rate of the reverse reaction just after adding C2H5CO2CH3? So you are now adding this. That is going up. So when you do that, right up there above that equation, and then you know the reaction shifts away from there because we have too much of that. I gave too many snowballs to one side and they started attacking the other side. So right after it is added, the rate 
of the reverse reaction is obviously greater than zero. Um, but it is uh, greater than the rate of the forward reaction because I have that arrow. So draw that arrow. If this, if this, um, if this is something that you're struggling with, draw that arrow like I did. That increase in C2H5 CO2 and the arrow moving in the opposite direction to decrease that amount. So I'll do my first mark away here. Um, greater than zero and equal to the rate of the forward reaction. Wait, okay, wait, 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 sorry. Uh, what is the rate of the reverse reaction? Greater than zero and equal to the rate of the forward reaction. That's that fourth one. Greater than zero and equal to the rate of the forward reaction. Oh, greater. Okay, yeah, no, we're good. Okay, what is, so we, we want to read this. We, what the heck? Oh, whatever. So this is the answer for that. Uh, so here, what is the rate of the reverse reaction when the equilibrium, when it has again reached equilibrium? So there's always going to be at least one, if not two, where it says it is at equilibrium. You know at equilibrium the rate of the forward is the same as the rate of the reverse reaction. And it's dynamic, meaning snowballs are constantly, this is an endless snowball fight. They're th it's going back and forth, back and forth. So what is the rate of the forward, reverse reaction? It's going to be greater than zero and equal to the rate of the forward reaction. Now, how much C2H5CO2, CH3 is in the flask? the system has again reached equilibrium. So you added 230 to it, but some of it goes away and it becomes the other side. And so it says how much more is in it, meaning you added 230, but it's gonna go down a little bit. So it's always how much more, but you know that it's gonna be less than what you add. So think about that. If, if the, I can understand how that might not come across well to everyone, but you add 230. Um, so for example, uh, I give the team on the right-hand side, the product side, 230 extra snowballs. They're gonna throw snowballs initially faster to the left side, but when it reaches equilibrium, when it reaches equilibrium, there's gonna be still more than what it had at the beginning because there's no more snowballs in the snowball fight. So some, but not less than 230, but less than 230, sorry. All right. All right, so good question. You gotta think through it, go through it. I know you can do it. Now, this one is different than the ones we did in class, but you did get on your Alex, and I do think I'm gonna give one to you. Again, for at least for these first ones, there's not a lot of things you can skip reading. Uh, now, here we have a reaction, and it says, imagine 121, forget that millimole thing, imagine 121 CH4s and 121 H2Os are added to an empty flask. Now that is the key. And answer the following questions. What would the rate of the forward reaction be before any CH4 H2O has been added to the flask? I sort of like how Alex does this. At the same time, I don't, um, but, I, but I want you to read the questions. So if we got a flask that has nothing in it, this is before, empty flask. So somehow they sucked all the air out of it which you can do out of a, out of a, you know, if you go into the pharmaceuticals or, you know, almost any job, I bet you come across in the engineering field a time where they literally suck all the air out of a container. I mean, it happens all the time, like not all the time, but you know, in, in uh, the industry world and whatever. So there's no air in there. So before anything's added, you can't have a reaction. So that's going to be zero. Now, what is the rate of the forward reaction, meaning left to right, 
right after, oh wait, just after, yes, CH4 and H2O have been added. You add CH4, you add H2O, you know that reaction to the right is going to occur fast because that's the only way it's gonna go. You only have stuff on the left, you only have reactants, so it's gonna be um, greater than the reverse reaction. Now you can't say the reverse reaction is not taking place because the second one forward reaction takes place, let's say a milli milli second, a hundred uh, picoseconds or whatever, the reverse reaction is gonna start. So the reverse reaction, uh, unless if it's at time equals zero, there is some, I'm making it too complicated. So yes, right after you add it, that forward reaction is gonna be greater than the reverse reaction. So you can even imagine that the reverse reaction is not even taking a place. What is the rate of the forward reaction at equilibrium? Every single one of these questions is gonna have this equal. They are equal. Forget about those words. Um, you go to the reverse reaction, all right? Now, how much CH4 will there be at equilibrium? Well, you initially gave CH4 121 snowballs. The reaction shifts right. So, meaning, again, you're giving one side of the team all the snowballs. It's going to eventually have less snowballs, but it's still going to have more than zero. So, some, but not less than 121, but less than 121. All right, cool, good. So now we, uh, some more Le Chatiers when it has to do with changing concentration. Uh, so we have this, it's always gonna say, has come to equilibrium, so predict the change, blah, blah, blah. All that you can forget about. You have this reaction up here. You have this right here. Some NH3 is removed. Now, this is how I think you should do it. Answer the far right question first. The shift in equilibrium. I take away NH3. Which way is this reaction going? I take away snowballs from the right side, from the product side. That reaction is going to go to the right the left side is gonna have more snowballs, that right side is gonna have less. So this reaction, I take it, take away NH3, the reaction makes up for the change in, um, in the dynamic equilibri equilibrium makes up for the change that has taken place. The reaction is gonna to shift to the right. I remove NH3, it is gonna to go to the right. If it goes to the right, the pressure or the amount of N2 it's going to go down. The amount of H2 is also going to go down because it shifts to the right. So maybe write that um, above the equation if you're struggling with it. Answer the far right one first, shifts to the right, then this has to go down, this has to go down, and then essentially NH3 goes back up. Not as far as it did. Well, I'm not going to that again is going to be confusing or it would add confusion of what I was about to say. So some H2 is added. H2 gets added. We need a shift away. If something gets added, we shift away from it. We have too much of it. That again shifts to the right. That again will decrease pressure N2 because it's just to the right, even though N2 wasn't even involved in it. You know, N2 is a little mad. It's because it's like, hey, I'm not the one that was increased. What, you know, you know what's the deal? But Le Chatier is like, no, man, you, you, too bad. You know, you're, you pick your side. And so N2 will go down, NH3 will go up. So pick the far right answer first. Carbon disulfide and oxygen react to form blah, 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 blah. So we know we have this reaction. It's going to say it's at equilibrium. 
It always does. So all these words just ignore. Now, CO2 is removed. That is removed. We're taking something away. We have to make up for that change. We are going to shift to the right. We have to make up for that CO2 change. When we shift to the right, the pressure of CS2 is going to go down because it's shifting away from that. The pressure of O2 is also going to go down. All right, so now CS2, mm, I'll switch colors or something for the second one. Uh, CS2 is added. Okay. Again, we're shifting to the right. We have to shift away. So if this helps you, you shift away from the side that something's being added. You shift towards the side of something that's being taken away. CS2 is added, it shifts to the right. Pressure of O2 will then decrease because O2 is part of the products. It's this team it signed up for. And CS2, wait, what did I read this? Oh no. O2 will decrease and CO2 will increase. All right, so go through that a couple of times if you don't fully understand it. Um, it, it, will, it will make sense and I have confidence that it will for you. So now we're talking about endothermic and exothermic reactions. You had experience um, in your lab where you mix hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide and it released heat. So exothermic, it feels hot, which is not that important for this quiz coming up. More so, heat is product. Product is on the right side of the reaction. Endothermic, it feels cold. And heat is reactant. So when you get these, I noticed in my teaching career, students haven't always done this. So this is again, module 22. When you get these, students haven't always done this, but and they still get it right. But I have to do it every time. Uh, just like I always have to write Leo Gur, I have to, with, if I solve any oxidation reduction, my brain just doesn't solve it unless if I write, this is an exothermic reaction, heat here. I have to do it or else I literally can't solve it. Well, I haven't, maybe I could, I don't even try. So I put heat right there. Now we have all these words, it reaches equilibrium, blah, blah, blah. The temperature is, so all this other stuff after that, you know what you're doing. All this right here, you don't really need. All you need is this equation and this right here. So the temperature is lowered. Heat is now lowered. Heat is a product. When something is lowered, it shifts in the direction to make up for the fact that it's lowered. So again, answer the far right question first. Heat is lowered. Temperature is lowered. It is shifts to the right. If it shifts to the right, there's going to be less CL2. So the pressure of CL2 will go down. The temperature is higher. So really these follow a pattern, which is good because I think, you know, that's how you learn is to see patterns. I mean, that's exactly how you learn is now temperature is raised. Let's see the far right first. We got to make up the temperature is too hot. It's going to shift to the left. And therefore, the pressure of CHCl3 will go, um, oh, first, yeah, let's answer this, will go down. We're matching these sort of, these chemical symbols with those. All right. So I think we got another one. Top sentence, I'm not reading, I don't care. 
Um, endothermic, awesome. Heat is being taken in to the reaction. It feels cold. The rest of the stuff, blah, blah, blah. The temperature is lowered. Down, we're shifting towards the side that something is lowered. We're making up for it. So we're shifting to the left. The pressure CO, now we gotta find CO right there. Since we're shifting left, that's gonna go down. So you can just write, maybe I'll just write H, heat. Okay, so again, it is endothermic. Temperature is raised. So now that H is going up. We have to make up for that change going to the right. The temperature is raised. The pressure of H2O will go down. Because it's shifting away. So you add, if you add something to the products, it shifts to the reactants. You add something to the reactants, it shifts to the products. You take something away from the products, it shifts to the products. You take something away from the reactants, it shifts to the reactants. You could teach it like that. I mean, that's not a horrible way of teaching it. Um, uh, so uh replay that if that made sense i think that that could be a good way to teach it uh and so the pressure of, uh will go down okay so now you're going to be asked to write a k expression now there like kinetics we learned there's a k expression we have an equilibrium k expression so simply we're going to go back to this equation that we had earlier h is not um part of the equilibrium expression simply equilibrium k equals products p on top over reactants These are all gases. They all are included in the equilibrium expression. So writing a concentration equilibrium constant expression. Alex doesn't change these up much. So I'm keeping the ones that we took in notes. Um, All right, so it's not letting me erase. This is, I re, I'm redoing the slide and it's not letting me erase this. All right, well, whatever. So we said earlier, A equals B, or A forms B, K is five. Now let's say we doubled A and we double, therefore B is gonna be, and B is doubled as well. Um, So A and B are both doubled. Then the K will be raised to the second power. So one, one, this is K, two, two, K squared. So K is gonna be 25. Now let's say if we had three A forms three B, K is five, K five is now cubed, that is 125. Now, lastly, if we were to reverse and multiply the reaction. So again, A forms B, K equals five. Now, if I were to then give you three B, three A, because again, who's to say what the product is? Who's to say what the reactant is? Since the product is being made, both are products. Both, since the product, the reactant's what's being wrapped in both are reactants. This is going to be reverse, so we know it's 1 over 5 cubed. We tripled it. And 
we reversed it. So k is going to be 1 over 125. So not too tough practice, though obviously helps. All right, so again, you can practice these with Alex, module 23. All right, so we got the k expression, blah, 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 blah. We have the reaction, blah, 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 blah. Now, looking at the, so when I say blah, 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 you don't have to read any of that. It's just that they have to write that in, I assume, to let you know there is stuff in the vessel. Okay, so that K expression is huge. K equals products over reactants. So therefore, there has to be a lot of products not a lot of reactants. That number is huge. So therefore, that bottom number is going to be small. Uh, reactants is going to be very little N2 and O2. Reactants are on this, the left side. Products are on the right side. All right. So now, what is blah, blah, blah. So I'm just going to look at this here. That gets doubled. And they always double it in the second one. Just no, no, that's reversed. Ugh. Sorry. They always reverse it in the second question, at least on Alex. Therefore, we know 1 over 9.14 times 10 to the 8th. Make sure you put parentheses in your calculator when you do that. And I see it too many times, and I'll rather, I, I, I want you um, to get the full points here. 1 over parentheses. That's a Good skill to have to know how to use parentheses in your calculator. So notice how this is absolutely reversed. None of the front numbers change. None of the front numbers change. The next one here, it's back to the same order. The same reactants are the same. The products are the same. But everything is tripled. You can look at the first one. That's one. First one, three. Uh, throughout my life, I would have students go, well, this isn't tripled. That's you know, up by four or whatever. They, they just wouldn't rationalize math. That is tripled. Two times three is six. So everything's going to be tripled or doubled. So all you have to do is really look at the first one and match it up with the one below it because you can't triple the reactants and double the products and it be at equilibrium. So all of them are going to be the same. Now that this is tripled, it's a forward reaction, meaning the same K only, 9.14 times 10 to the eighth, parentheses, tripled, cubed. Make sure to use parentheses correctly. All right, I guess we got one more, uh, well, we got more, a lot more slides. All right, so this one here, this is a good one because K value is 0 0.69. It's pretty close to one. It's either going to be huge, very small, or close to one. If you take chem two, this comes up as very important looking at that K value, but you're always going to see a K value really large, really small, um, or close to one uh, of this, whatever we have this reaction here. So we have K close to one. I know that these first two answers are not gonna be true. So neither of the two is above. Just like before, the next question on Alex is um, the, the reaction above reversed, one over 0 0.69. And then just like before, the next question on Alex is the original K cubed. I want to write these parentheses. I'm going to write those because to get you in the habit. All right, so on to the next topic. Talk about the gas laws. Uh, gas laws have everything to do 
with P, uh, that's not a good color, P pressure, V volume, T temp per sure in K. Now you're going to learn about all these different ways of pressure. In chemistry, we define pressure in numerous, numerous ways, kind of annoyingly that we haven't been able to decide one because pressure is all measured the same way. I don't know if you're, my birds are freaking out right now. Um, they sometimes, I don't know, bird psychology. But anyways, uh, pressure can be measured. You're going to see KPA in SI units, or not SI units, but in chemistry, you know, KPA, MMHG. You can see in your lab, TOR, um, KPA, MMHG, and ATM. ATM is... If there is any one that has the lead, per se, it's ATM. Uh, volume, generally speaking, should be in liters. And uh, you can keep it in milliliters at times, but when you get into the more complicated gas laws, so for the students who got into PV equals NRT, I suggest changing it to liters, changing it to ATM, 760 TOR equals 1 ATM. And 101 uh, uh, KPA equals 1 ATM. 101.03. Uh, 101 eh, I'm sorry. I don't remember that off the top of my head. 101.3 or something, whatever. So look that up if you get KPA. However, for the sake of this lesson, answer, if asked for pressure, answer with the units that are given in the question, unless if otherwise is asked. So these are the formulas for the three major gas laws. We have Boyle's law. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Charles' law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Gay-Lussac's law, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. <clears throat> Finally, the combined gas law, which is the one that I want students to use. Now, if a teacher asks, use Boyle's law to solve for the following problem. In my experience, Students then go, oh my gosh, which one's Boyle's Law? Okay, you know, they spend too much time looking to, trying to determine which law they should use. And a memorization of a law, to me, is less important than knowing when to not use a variable that is not changing. So if something is the same in both conditions, it doesn't play a role. So hence, that's why I've learned in my teaching to give the combined gas law and have the student decipher which variable not to use. So none of these words here I want you to care about. I want you to care about P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. And always know to, as long as Boyle's, Charles, or Gay-Lussac's law is being asked, to eliminate one of the variables. So just to explain what Boyle's Law is, let's say you have a closed container, what would happen to the pressure inside the container to decrease volume? You have a balloon, it's a closed container of gas, you squeeze the balloon, the pressure goes up, and boom pops, or whatever. So as volume goes down, pressure goes up. As volume goes up, pressure goes down. And that is uh, simple. You know, that's something we all can imagine in our head. Okay, so you can practice these module 20. 
So, understanding Boyle's Law, again, I'm just going to have you ignore that for the sake of learning. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2, instead of just thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, which one's Boyle's Law? Then my students would always like to do this. P1, V1, T1. P2, V2, T2. All right. Cylinder is filled with 10 liters. Nope. Liters is a volume. Initial. Piston is put into it. The initial pressure is 100 kPa. 125 kPa. This is now pulled up, expanding the gas until the gas is the final volume of 65 liters. Calculate the final pressure of the gas. Be sure the answer your correct answers. So temperature is not used. One variable is not used. Boils, Charles, Gay, Lusix, one variable is not used. I still, instead of remembering, memorizing each one, use P1, V1 over T1, P2, V2 over T2. Now T is not used, so then we can use P1, 125, V1, 10, equals P2, V2, is 65. And from that, it's simple math. And I get 19.2. I'll just write out a larger number. 19.23 kPa. Now, Let's go back to the original question. Three sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs. Final answer, three sig figs. Now, when I taught this in high school, I always made a line. I always said, does this make sense? Now, you don't see this because I deleted it, but this is the second time that I've done this slide because I actually accidentally put in 100 here. I did not put the decimal in the first time I did this. And then I said what I'm about to say, which is logically go back and think to yourself, does this make sense? And when I had students write below, does this make sense and why, uh, I had almost 100% success rate. Uh, because I would have got this one wrong. Like I entered it wrong in my calculator. And I went back and said, does this make sense? I'm like, no, it doesn't make sense. Now, this does make sense because the volume is increasing. There's the same amount of gas in there. The pressure is therefore going to be decreasing. And it goes from 125 to 19.2. They are correlated, uh, negatively correlated. So the pressure goes down. So I had... Um, 192, and I was like, oh boy. So maybe, yes, always go back and say to yourself, does this make sense? We have another gas law. Says using Boyle's law, don't try to remember what Boyle's law is. So a cylinder is filled with 10 liters of gas. I'll, I'll just write 10 because we can go back and check for six phase later. Pressure, KPA is a source of pressure, no temperature. Piston is now pushed down, compressing the gas until the gas has a final volume of 2.4. Cook the final pressure, pressure mark, no temperature. So we can go P1, whatever I keep here there. Ah, 234. Pressure of one. We get rid of T1 up there. P1, 234. Uh, P1, V1, 10. P2, we do not know, times V2, 2.4.
So here, we're pushing down that piston to volumes one fourth. So pressure is going to be something big. Pressure should be um, essentially four times as high. 234 times 10 divided by 2.4, 975 kPa. Does that make sense? We started off at 234, volume goes down. Yes, it makes sense. Three sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs. There you go, 975 kPa. All right, Charles Law. Now let's say you have a closed container. What would happen to the volume of the container if you're to decrease temperature? So you have a basketball or you have a football play during the summer um, and during the winter you pick up that basketball you try to dribble it and it's like smaller you know like some of the gas is out or um, or hot air balloons is the standard explanation for these like you uh, those people the crazy people they put a balloon over them and then they heat up the balloon and the volume goes up, decreasing the density. Therefore, the balloon goes up in the air, and uh, and then I don't know why they go up there. They drop stuff on people, or they spit on people, or something. I don't know what what this sport is, uh, what the end goal is for them. All right, so using Charles Law, I'm gonna again just. Go with P1, V1 over T1, because P2, V2 over T2, P1, V1, T1, P2, V2, T2. All right, the Arctic balloon filled with 31.6 liters, 31.6, helium, Temperature in the shed is 7 Celsius. We're going to add 273 to that. So T1 is 280. Point. So 280.273.7. Pressure, um, it's taken outside to where the temperature is 2 degrees Celsius. 273 plus 2. 275. So remember Celsius and Fahrenheit are fake like Drake temperatures. So fake like Drake. And temperature Kelvin is real like me. You can tell Drake I said that because it is true. All right. So uh, temperature is taken outside. Exactly, look, notice how it says it stays constant. The um, pressure stays constant, so we can get rid of pressure. Volume, so then we got always got to sell for one. We can get rid of pressure, so volume one, 31.6, temperature one, 280. Volume two, we do not know. Temperature two, 275. Solve once, or divide once and multiply. 31.6 divided by 280 times 275. So I got, I'm gonna write more numbers than I need so we can go back for sig figs. 31.036. Um, liters. Now think about it rationally. Temperature goes down. Volume should go down and volume did go down. Now sig figs, we got three, three, three. You can't go back to the original question for this one because we added 273. That makes it three sig figs. So the final answer is 31.0 liters. 
All right, maybe, yeah, I probably don't tell Drake I said that. I don't know, man. He's, he seems all nice. Canadian, he was in, like, on the Disney Channel, but now, I don't know, man. I think he's got some people. So, all right, anyways, here we go. P1, V1 over T1. P2, V2 over T2. P1, V1, T1. P2, V2, T2. All right. Uh, volume 1, 48.2. I'm getting tired. 278. Uh, temperature 2, 42. 270, I don't know. 42. Negative 42 plus 273. That's all right. Negative 42 plus 273. 232. Temperature is going down, so the pressure remains one. Temperature is going down, volume should go down two. So we got eliminating pressure, volume one, 48.2, T1, 278. Volume two, we don't know, 232. Cross multiply and divide. 48.2 times 232 divided by 278. So the new volume is 40.2 liters. Does that make sense? We are lowering the temperature, so volume should go down. We have three sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs. Final answer, three sig figs. All right. One more for the basic gas laws. gay lucix pressure and temperature. So what would happen to the pressure of a container if you increase temperature? So if you have a uh, closed container, you heated it, eventually that closed container of gas will explode because the pressure is going up and up. Or if some of you remember Tom Brady, where like the ball had to be at like 12.5 PSI, but then the refs, like the player on the other team picked up the ball and was like, this ball is deflated. And Tom Brady like, uh, made comments that he likes deflated footballs because he can throw them ball better. And it was, um, 11.9 PSI, and uh, so they said that the ball boy deflated the football, um, and the um, Tom Brady's argument, the Patriots' argument, was they filled up the football inside a locker room, which was like 100 degrees, if not more, and then they took the football out. It was in Seattle, which was like 40 degrees. And therefore, since when temperature goes down, pressure goes down, that's why the football measured to be lower PSI um, than what was required by the NFL. And um, Tom Brady still got the ban because both the ball boy and Tom Brady destroyed their cell phones. <laughs> so... You know, if they didn't deflate the football, why would they destroy their cell phones? But that's what they ended up getting, the four, or why Brady got the four-game suspension was, you know, because there is some evidence that the pressure would go down, but not that much. So, you know, he's an athlete. He looks for um, little advantages. All right, so... Uh, Gay-Lussac's law, we'll just do a couple. Now we see ATM and we see MMHG. Uh, P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. P1, 1.5, T1, 273 plus 21, 294. Uh, what would be the pressure? So volume's nowhere mentioned. We don't know what P2 is. The temperature is raised to 121. Um, T2, 
221 plus 273, 394. So we'll skip this one here so I can, so we know P1, V1 over T1. We can get rid of volume. So we got uh, P1, 1.50 over T1, 294. Because P2, we do not know, 394. Divide and, or cross multiply and divide, or divide and then multiply by 394, 1.50 divided by 294 times 394. So I got temperature goes up, so the pressure should go up. I ended up getting uh, 2.01 and it's in the same amount of pressure, ATM. All right, so we know that this is, we just eliminated volume, so we'll skip the first step, pressure one. 288. Nope. So keep out, keep a lookout for this. What was the initial pressure? So the pressure given to us is the final pressure. So T1 is 273 plus 112. That's 373, 383, 385. 385K. T2 uh, 224 plus 273. So these you got to read a little carefully, but I know you can do it. 497. Uh, and it's heated at that temperature. It is 298. So that is P2, 288. What is P1? So I'm just going to do this. P1, so we don't know what P1 is, so P2, 288, divided by T2, 497. Then we know T1, so I'm going to multiply that by 385. So P2 is 224. That makes sense, or P1 is 224, and that makes sense because the temperature goes up. Therefore, the initial pressure should be lower. So what is this? 220? Nope, 223. 223. Um, this is pressure, so let's go with the same pressure. KPA, three six figs. All right, so that's about it. Um, Teams message me with questions. Quiz Monday.